We'll begin reading in verse number 4. This is talking about after Jesus had rose from the grave, but not yet ascended back into heaven. It says, verse number 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, the beginning of the book of Acts, for those of you who don't know, Acts is short for the full title, which is the Acts of the Apostles. Well, in order to start the Apostles, right, they had to be empowered. Okay, the difference between a disciple and an apostle is that an apostle had the Holy Ghost. Okay, they could not have been an apostle without the Holy Ghost. If you study out the things that they did, they could not have been apostles without the unction and the power of God. But they weren't the only ones that got the Holy Ghost. All those that believed. In fact, as you study the book of Acts, you'll find that in the beginning, salvation looked a little bit different than what it does nowadays, but by the end of the book of Acts, it's exactly as we believe and we receive today. The moment that you believe and you receive salvation, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost instantaneously. There was a point in time where there was the laying on of hands and he had to breathe on. Now, all that was transitional. It served its purpose and its time. But the book of Acts, talking about the Acts of the Apostles, right? just like every page of your Bible, the Acts of the Apostles were inspired and breathed by the Holy Ghost. The events of your everyday life, whether or not you realize it, are inspired by the will of an almighty God. Well, verse number four, those, the believers, right, the ones that had been shut up in houses, that had been fearful because they thought the Jews were going to come and kill them like they had killed Jesus, those that were faithful, that believed, they gathered together with Christ. And it says that Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Keep in mind, that's a little contrary to what their flesh wants to do right at that point. The last thing they want to do is be around the people that hate them the most, which would have been the Jewry. Okay, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Okay, those that had authority over the Jews that were upset at everything that Christ had taught. But he says, nope, you're staying right here. Smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem. In other words, I want you where the enemy is most prevalent. He says, don't leave Jerusalem. He says, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. He says, we've talked about it already. He says, I've promised that the Holy Ghost shall come. In fact, Jesus said that he must needs go away so that the Comforter might come. Right? It was dire that they received the Holy Ghost. Christ had to ascend to heaven so that the Holy Ghost could fulfill his purpose of what the Father promised he would do. He says, stay here. Where, to paraphrase, it's the scariest, it's the most dangerous, you got the most enemies... And right now, they're trying to cover up the fact that Jesus got out the grave. They're looking to wipe all evidence of the fact that that stone moved. And then when they can't refute that, then they say that the disciples came and stole them away. They pay off the guards at the tomb to tell a lie. They're doing everything they can to make sure that the name Jesus in their mind, stays dead. Now, there's just one problem with that. He wasn't dead. And two, if God wills it, there's nothing a man can do to stop it. 
But he says, stay here. Not stay down at the five-star hotel with all the amenities and room service and where you've got a butler. No, stay here in the midst of the enemy with fear wrestling with you every day and be patient. Wait. Verse number five, he says, For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Anybody know how many not many is? It's more than one, but less than many. Because he said not many. He didn't give them a time frame. He didn't give them a wall calendar, one of them advent calendars for Christmas, where it's alright, just open one of these every day, and then when you get to the end, the Holy Ghost will be here. No. He said, stay here. Holy Ghost is coming. But the time frame he gives them is not many days hence. He's God. You know how many, many can be to God? Could be all of eternity. Now, I don't believe he meant it that way. I believe he was trying to comfort them right here. He said, not many days. But I know how the flesh works. As soon as Christ ascended back up into heaven, they were saying, well, how many is not many? Well, it's not many, but it's more than some. More than a few, more than a couple. When's he going to be here? We don't know. When's he coming? I don't know. How's he coming? I don't know. What did they have? They had the promise of God, which really is all that they ever had. They may not have known that, but when they were walking around with Christ for some three and a half years in his earthly ministry, they didn't have a promise of how their families were going to be taken care of, how their families' needs were going to be met, how all of their daily necessities would be met. I mean, we all know this, the account where tax season came along and Jesus pulled a fish out of the water and had all the money in it. Right? They didn't know that Jesus was going to do that when he said, come follow me, and they left everything and followed after him. I mean, we heard it preached on not too long ago, the account of Peter's mother-in-law. Right? Peter left wife, mother-in-law, and family at home. They didn't travel with him. James and John left their dad Zebedee on the fishing boat. Not to mention everything that they had back at their houses. They forsook all and followed Christ without any promises. And yet again, now the promise is, I'm going away. You can't come with me. Where I go, you cannot follow he says, but, wait here. In this place, where all the bad stuff has happened lately, wait here, and not many days since the Holy Ghost will be here. Now we know that it took about 40, because on the day of Pentecost, that's when the Holy Ghost came and fell. There were 120 praying in the upper room. I don't know about you. I don't know what many means. But 40 is closer to many than it is to not many in Jordan's book. There were 120 praying in the upper room, right, trying to get in one mind and one accord so that they'd be unified when the Holy Ghost did come. But for 40 days, all they had was faith. Then, not, this is how you know that they were Baptists. He says, hey, the Holy Ghost is coming, everything's going to be okay. And they say, Lord, before you go, can we ask you another question? Right, that's the Baptist. Right, Thanks for that great promise. We'll think about that after you're gone. But hey, while you're still here, can we ask you something? They said, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're saying, Lord, are you going away? Are you staying? The Holy Ghost is coming. You just promised us that. We don't really care about that right now. All we care about is, are you going to get rid of the Romans? And are you going to sit on the, king, or the throne of King David? Are you going to make Israel a nation again? Right, that's what everybody thought before this. In his earthly, I mean, that's what Peter thought. He goes study the life of Christ. He thought that Jesus was going into town, going to set up camp, 
That's why he said, Lord, you're not going to die on the cross. He said, you're going and you're going to sit on the throne. Jesus said, it, Peter, you're an idiot. Everything I've told you is that I came to become the lamb. To be the lamb. For, not just for Israel, but for all mankind. But even now, they're like, okay, we got it. You went to the cross. You died. You rose again. Now are you going to set up the kingdom? Jesus said in verse number 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He says, None of that's your business. Then at the latter end of the verse, he says, The times and seasons, the things that he said wasn't for them to know. It said, The Father hath put in his own power. He says, God's got it in his hand. That should be enough for you. He says, those things, God's got full control over them. God hadn't let the time or the seasons or the circumstances. He said, none of that's fallen over to the devil to where he has control over it. He says, God still has a firm hold on it. Then by implication, because in verse number 8, he says, but. In other words, he says, all that stuff, don't worry about it. Here's what you need to worry about. But. You shall receive power. When? He said, well, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. He says, you know what you need to be concerned with? You need to be concerned with unction, power from the Holy Ghost, and you need to be concerned with your representation, your ambassadorship, because you're going to have to be a witness. You know what they're thinking about? They're thinking about being servants. They think he's going to go sit on the throne and they're going to get cushy office positions and they're going to be able to just live the easy life. If he sits on the throne, all of our problems will be over. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Said, well, if the Lord would just do this, my life would just, it would sort itself out. No, it wouldn't. Because you're still a part of it. Amen. Amen. But life is not problematic because of what God does not do. Life is problematic because of what people do. That this world is cursed by sin. It's only by the grace of God that it hadn't spun out a course already. But they're thinking, if he just goes and he sits on the throne and he restores the kingdom to Israel, everything will be better than ever. It'll be a perfect land, which one day it will be. It's called the millennium reign. But they say, if Jesus should just go and restore the kingdom, everything will be solved. We don't have to worry about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. We don't have to worry about the centurions or the Caesar or Pilate, any of them. Everything will just, it'll solve itself. Then he says, nope. Don't worry about that. You know what you need to be concerned with? Power and being a witness. In other words, he's saying you're going to receive power. You know why they hadn't had it already? They weren't ready for it. Okay, you know why, if you're smart, you start a kid off with like a little cap gun, then you go to a Nerf gun, then you go to one of those knockoff Red Rider BB guns that can't, you know, have enough power to put a BB through a piece of paper. Uh, then you go to BB gun, air rifle. You step why? You're preparing them for the power eventually of what? A handgun. Or a rifle. You have to teach them respect for what it is that they can do with this instrument. Jesus is saying, Holy Ghost hadn't come yet because y'all not ready to handle it. You're not prepared. Mentally, you're not prepared to go out and become a witness for me. Keep in mind, these are the same group of people he sent out. I'm certain that they would have been among them. The ones that the 70 that he sent out in two by two into the cities to prepare the way. For, they're like, Lord, we've already been a witness. He says, not like this. He said, then you did it because of a commandment. Right? He sent them. He said, after the Holy Ghost comes, you're going to want to go willingly. It didn't say that he would send them to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. No. It says, ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem 
in all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. He didn't say, I'm sending you. He just says, once the Holy Ghost shows up, once you're empowered, your desire is going to be to go. He says, and there's going to be no stopping you. You'll get to the uttermost part of the, the earth. Eventually, the Word of God will reach every nook and cranny upon the face of the earth, according to the promise of God. He's saying, Brother Jordan, they were worried about time. They were worried about a temple setting one up for the Lord so that he could reign. He's worried about their responsibility with the things of God in receiving the Holy Ghost and then their departure. He says, some of y'all are going to stay here in Jerusalem. But some of y'all are going to go a little bit further. Some of you are going to go a long way. Some of y'all are going to go places that you didn't even know existed. He said, all because you want to tell somebody else about me. But, what I want to teach on this morning, verse number 6, or I'm sorry, verse number 7, it says, He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now Jesus could have said, It's not for you to know the times. That would have been enough. He could have said, It's not for you to know the seasons. That would have been enough. Why do he say both? I ask myself questions like this. He says, It's not for you to know the time and the seasons. He says, which the Father hath put in his own power. Obviously they're important because God made sure to reserve them and protect them with his power. God's in charge of the time and the seasons. It's important. Because if it wasn't important, God wouldn't care about it. And he says, it's not for you to know. Do you know what that word know means? It means to comprehend or understand. Uh, you could teach somebody very early on in school how to read the hands on a clock. Nowadays they get to cheat because all the clocks are going digital. Okay? I think we should make them go back to military time just to make it that much more difficult on them. Because, oh, it's 746. Well, not if it says 1946 on it. What does that one mean? Right? Throw them off. But you teach somebody how to read a clock. It's different to know what the number on the clock means. That it's broken down into 24 roughly even intervals. Right, that there's a master clock somewhere over in Greenwich, over in the UK, universal clock. That it all is based off of how long it takes our planet to turn once. Then that parlays into the calendar, which, give or take, one month per cycle of the moon, which rotates around the earth. After about 12 of those, give or take a few days, we've made it around the sun once. Time, in man's eye, is all about how long it takes to get something done. That's what time means. That's what a day is. A day is how long it takes the sun to come up and then go back down. That's what night is. That's how long it takes for the sun to go away and then come back again. It's how long it takes to accomplish something. That's what time is to man. You know what time is to God? Inconsequential. Man's worried about time. God's not worried about time. He holds everything in the palm of his hand. But it'd really blow your mind to realize that God created everything, but God didn't create time. Man started tracking those things. With God, it's always daytime. There's no night. With God, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Time has no constraint or any relevance to him. He's God. He made everything. He made everything before people started keeping time, and he's going to be around long after people stop keeping time. But there's no wristwatch in heaven. Y'all realize that? You understand that these things that we carry around, this is all based off of the creation of man? But time, when it comes to what Jesus is talking about here, 
You know what time there is with God? There's time to do it now. There's the time to do it in the future. And there's the time that's already passed. God is always present. Why do you think he always says, I am? Amen. He said, my name is I am. Why? Because he's always here, right now, in the present. He's also in the future. He's also in the past. He's omnipresent. But he chose to identify himself as I am. He's here. You know what time you should be concerned with? The time that you have now. You don't have time next hour, later on in the day. That hadn't come yet. All you've got is what God's given you right now. Christ says, don't worry about time. That's not for you to know, to understand. You know what you're supposed to be prepared for? What you have right here. He says, that's what you should, be, should know. Why am I here? What does God want me to do? How do I do it? That's what Christ was concerned with. He came to do the will of the Father. Not to know the will of the Father. Not to understand the will of the Father. Not to be all holy. Jesus being holy wouldn't have done anything for us if he didn't do the will of the Father and become the sacrifice for man's sin. It was his concern to do. You know what that means? He was worried about now. You don't get things done by thinking about tomorrow. You don't get things done by thinking about yesterday. He says, you let God sort time out. Time's too big for you. You worry about now. But then he says, or the seasons. You see, they're wanting Jesus to say in four months, 16 days, 12 hours, 9 minutes, and 40, 42 seconds, I'm going to sit on the throne and I'm going to restore Israel to its kingdom. He says, don't worry about time. Time got nothing to do with it. Time is God. God's got the whole schedule figured out. But see, time is specific in the eyes of man. There is a time. Right? We started today at what? 10 o'clock. Why? Because that's the time, the specific point of the day. Regardless of which Sunday it is, 10 a.m., we know Sunday school is going to kick off. It's a specific moment in time. A season is a period of time. I see seasons, much more general, when we think about it. Now, depending on where you go on the globe, season's going to be different. The characteristics of those seasons are going to be a little bit different. Down around the equator, they don't have much of a difference, or the extreme in temperature switches as they do, you know, a couple of hours north of us, where they can get about five feet of snow over the winter and then it can still be 90 degrees in the summer okay but wherever you go the seasons have characteristics okay back then they didn't call them spring summer fall winter what they call them they call them harvest season they call them planting season they called it the reaping season there was a season of rest that was usually winter when things wouldn't grow it's talking about more than just a calendar. A season is a pattern. And if you're honest, your life has lots of patterns in it. Right? There's a season to go to work. There's a season to come home. There's a season to do chores. There's a season to take care of things at the house. There's a season to take care of things at the church. You say, well, yeah, that happens on a weekly basis. You're thinking in time again. A week is just seven days. But there's a season. There's an appointed time where things are proper to do those things. Okay, it's proper to plant when? In the springtime. Because that's where the ground has been prepared after all winter for you to go out, put seeds in, it can suck the nutrients out of the dirt, and then in fall time you're going to have a harvest. Right, it's proper to do it in spring because it takes as long as it does to get the harvest in fall. You plant after spring, you're not going to have a harvest because it's not going to be ripe before winter comes. Right? Spring is the appropriate time to do it. Okay, there was a season to pay taxes in the Bible. Right? You guys remember the beginning of Luke? That when Cyrenius was governor, that Caesar put out that all the world should be taxed. 
there was a season to do it, to have it done by, that it was proper. When did Joseph come to Bethlehem? Because that's the place of his origin. He did it when the taxes were due, in the right season. He didn't show up early and he didn't show up late. He showed up in the right season, which God just so happened to ordain as the time that Christ would come. Amen. In God's eyes, seasons are not set rigid things on the calendar. Seasons are patterns. He says, it's not your job to know the patterns of your life. You may be able to see them, but it's not your job to understand them. What are those patterns? Well, there's time of growth. Okay, that's when you're walking up the mountain. You've been in the valley, but as you're walking up, you get the sunlight, what do you do? You grow. Then eventually you're going to hit a plateau spiritually. That's another season. That's where it feels like you're not going up, you're not going down, you've just got this little straight, leveled off area called a plateau. Why? That's for you to get used to what you've just learned, to put into practice those things that God has prepared you with. There's the valleys. What's that? That's where you test what's been learned. That's where things get dark, where things get hard, where storms come, where you've got to go through hard situations to prove to yourself and to prove to other people around you that are watching you that what's in you is tougher than anything that the world can throw at you. There's the mountaintop seasons. What's that? That's the time of rejoicing, relaxation. That's where everything is sunshine and rainbows. Those are seasons of your life. When do they come? When God says they should come. They're not bound to a calendar. Well, Lord, this valley's lasted longer than any other one. It's just a season. But God's in control of when it's going to change. It's not your job, it's not your place to understand the patterns that God puts in people's lives. He's in control of that. He knows what he's doing. But he says, it's not only not your place to know the time, he says, or the seasons. He says, I could explain everything to you from now until I sat on the throne, but they still wouldn't have understood it. He says, you can wonder, you can think, you can spend all of your time trying to figure it out. He says, it's not your place. Not your place to know the seasons. You may be able to see them. You may be able to tell when they're shifting. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or have a meteorology degree, okay, to go outside and realize it's getting colder. Fall might be around the corner. Don't take a genius to realize that when trees start having leaves fall off of them, hmm, season might be fixing to change. Or in springtime, right, when it goes from foggy and you know, every morning it's real misty outside, all of a sudden it's 80 degrees. Hmm, summer might be right around the corner. Seasons are observable. It don't take a rocket scientist as a Christian to realize, you know what? Things are getting a little bit harder the past week or week and a half than they have been before. We might be headed downhill. Or we might get, you know, be fixing to take a hike up the side of a mountain. May not be enjoyable. But if you can see it coming, what can you do? You can prepare for it. God didn't make you ignorant. He doesn't surprise you every day with a jack-in-the-box that says, here's what your day's going to be. Right? His ways are above our understanding, but He does give us a little bit of enlightenment. He doesn't want us to be unprepared. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we should be prepared as Christians. Not only for what comes today, but Lord willing, if there is a tomorrow, that we're prepared to handle that too. But see, what Jesus is talking about here in this verse, he says, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons. He said, stop looking at the watch. Okay, they didn't have them back then. But they did have a very accurate and complicated system of tracking time. He said, don't worry about the hours when they go out and they ring the bell and they tell you what hour of the day it is or what hour of the night it is. He says, don't worry about that. He says, don't even worry about seasons. He says, seasons, those patterns, he says, God's going to orchestrate them. You don't need to figure out how it's going to go from freezing to summer temperatures because God's got seasons in between. 
God will line everything up. He'll prepare it. He'll set it away. And then after summer, guess what? It's going to get cool again. There's going to be patterns. God's in charge of that. Don't worry about it. He said, don't worry about yesterday, tomorrow, or today. Just worry about now. And he said, don't worry even about the patterns. Trying to predict what's coming next. Because I promise you this. If you say this is what God's going to do, I'd mark it down that that guy's a liar. Unless it's founded upon the Bible. God winks at our ignorance and he might still do it. But no man knows when God's going to do something, how God's going to do it, or how God's going to manifest it. God may answer a prayer just not the way that you thought he was going to answer it. There are seasons, but even poor Richard's almanac doesn't have it down to the day of the first snow every year. Right? Whatever the guy on TV tells you, he's going to be wrong. I've told you what I do is I stick my hand out the window. That's what I wear for the day. If it comes back wet, uh, it's raining. But if it's hot, then I probably shouldn't put on a coat. If it's cold, we might think about a coat. It depends on how cold, because I'm a polar bear. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? What I'm saying is, God's not telling you, don't even worry about trying to chart out the pattern of your lives in the future. He's saying, just be worried about here. Now, what you can do today. Because notice what he says in verse number eight. He says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He says, there's coming a day that God's going to give you power, but it ain't going to happen until the Holy Ghost gets here. He says, and the Holy Ghost isn't going to come until God says that it's time for him to come. He says, it's not going to be many days, but it's going to be a couple of days. It's going to be a few days. Ended up being 40 days. He says, if all you're worried about time and seasons, you're going to miss something. Okay? Anybody ever been in a car ride? And all you do is you think about the destination as the longest drive of your life. Because you weren't thinking about where you were. You were thinking about where you was going to be. Those 120 in the upper room. If all they'd have been thinking about is, Lord, how much longer? Holy Ghost wouldn't have come in 40 days. It would have taken a lot longer. Because if all they were focusing on was the destination and not being prepared for when they get to the destination, the Holy Ghost couldn't have come because they wouldn't have been in the right mind to receive it. If all they were thinking about was the patterns of it, well, let's see, it took the Lord, oh, give or take, 6,000 years to show up after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, or 4,000 after the Lord told Adam and Eve in the garden that one day there'd be one that came that would, you know, wound the head of the serpent. That was the first prophesied telling that Christ was coming. Well, if we do that math, it took 4,000 years for Jesus to show up. The Holy Ghost might be here in 4,000 more. You got the pattern wrong. You tried to use man's logic to predict something that God had already foretold. I don't think they doubted that he was coming. They just doubted when. He said, don't worry about it. He said, don't even worry about the kingdom. He says, that's way off. He says, you're thinking about something that's going to happen way down the line. He says, you need to worry what's going to happen within, give or take, the next month. He says, don't try to figure out the patterns. You know what I found? Regardless of what pattern your life has taken, the Holy Ghost, God, Christ, the Father, however you want to define it, He's still good. Amen. You know when you forget that? When you stop thinking about now... And you start focusing on tomorrow or later today or the next season or how you're going to prepare for this or for that. If all you're focusing on is getting ready for something that you may never see. None of these people in the flesh saw Jesus sit on the throne. They're going to come back on white horses with him one day when he sits down on his throne. But they were trying to get prepared for something that they wouldn't see in their earthly lifetime. Jesus said, you're wasting your time. Don't worry about times and seasons. Worry about now. Worry about what's next. Because God will give you a direction. 
may not tell you how long it's going to take you to get there, but he'll tell you what's next. Further on down the line, we'll get there. Well, when are we going to get there? When God says we get there. I know where we're headed. And I know where I'm at. As long as I know which way to go, you know what that can do? That's called a journey. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, a race. A course. You've got a direction, you've got a heading, you can go do something for God. You've got now, and you've got next. You know what those two things have nothing to do with? Time. You know what they do have to do with? Order. There's a difference. Next just means it comes after what's now. You know what a season is? That's trying to chart out what's next. What's around the corner? Nope. You went too far. I tell a guy I work all the time. Some people can't see the forest for the trees. I work with a guy that he can't even see the tree bark because he's zoomed in with a microscope looking at the rings on the inside of the tree trying to figure out why it didn't grow as much as other years back in 1946. Right? The devil's in the detail, but some details don't matter. Not knowing what's next does not mean that you know what the next season's going to be. You know when Jesus said, let us pass over unto the other side, he didn't tell them there's going to be a storm in the middle of it. But they knew what was next. He said, we're going there. And that was enough. Well, how do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because when he was asleep, even though the boat was full of water, he was still sleeping on the boat. The boat hadn't sunk, even though it's full of water. Long before all that happened, you know what he did? He gave him a heading, and he said, that's where we're going. Why did Jesus lay down one of the few times in the Bible we find him resting? Why did he do that? To prove a point to him. He said, you don't need to know how the boat's going to get there. You don't need to know what you're going to face along the way. All you need to know is which direction to head and stay pointing in that direction. They even tried to row. What's the Bible say? That the winds were contrary to them. There was only one way that boat was going to get across the river or get across that lake. It was by the will of God, in God's timing, under God's power. You know why they couldn't row out of the storm? Because God wanted them to learn a lesson. You don't know why he had to stand up and say, Peace be still? He rebuked the winds and the waves, but those words were for the hearts of the men on that boat. They were riled up on the inside. They needed to learn that their faith can still the storms within their heart. God gave them a direction. He said, what's next? They knew where they were now. That's all they needed to make a journey. They didn't need to know when they were going to get there. They just needed to know where to go. You can put it into your GPS, and GPS can tell you, well, you should be there around this time, but GPS don't know about traffic. GPS doesn't know about storms that pop up and blow away I-40. GPS a lot of times don't know about detours. There's an importance of knowing where you're going, but God never charted out exactly how or when you was going to get there. Those are in the seasons. That's in time. Stop thinking about life through time and seasons. Instead, focus on this. He says, but ye shall receive power. You know what the thing about power is? Especially for a Christian, we know it's not ours. But the arm of flesh will fail you. It didn't say that the flesh would become strong. No, he said, you shall receive power. You know all the power you got is through the Holy Ghost? Spiritually. Yeah, we know that God gives gifts unto people, but people, when they quote that verse, forget that it says spiritual gifts. He gave unto some to do this, some to do that. You know where those gifts come from? Through the providence of God, and they're empowered through the Holy Ghost. That's why you're able to do something for God with them. Not talking about talents, I'm talking about things that God gifted to people so that they could do a specific will or purpose in their life. 
He says, you need to be concerned about power. Because you know the thing about power? I don't know why I'm on guns this morning, but we're going to do this. You can't put a 12-gauge shotgun shell into a 16-gauge shotgun shell barrel without modifying it. But even if you did modify it, it may shoot once, but it's not going to shoot much because that barrel is going to fail. That barrel was designed for something that was smaller, that didn't have as much power. Okay, now just because a 410 shotgun shell and a 45 long Colt have the same diameter of shell doesn't mean that all the guns that shoot one are going to shoot the other. Here's another fun fact for you. Did you know that a 12 gauge shotgun shell has the same diameter as a 50 BMG sniper rifle round? <laughs> or the same 50 cal that's used on the giant browning machine guns that you always see mounted on top of tanks and stuff? It's the same size around. Never in my life had I ever wondered, well, what would happen if we swapped them? <laughs> but see, there's these things called rednecks, and some of them have thought about that. The answer is not much, because they're not designed for one another. But the short story is, if the power is more than what the vessel can handle, it's going to be bad. That's usually what they call a catastrophic failure. You know what that means? Something went boom that wasn't supposed to go boom. That's bad. Well, see, God is not in the industry of destroying things that he has created. God creates, why? To serve a purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. God has destroyed some things because it's what was best in that situation. But that wasn't the will of God. That was the will of the person that was disobedient. God gave him every opportunity to repent of it. And then God eventually said, I'll destroy the flesh. Why? So that the soul might be saved. But see, God did not make the new creature in you just to drop an M80 in it and watch it explode. Okay? Also... Seth, you're probably smart enough to figure this out now. Don't drop an M80 into a toilet bowl. Bad things going to happen. <laughs> I've seen the, vi the videos. Or inside of a mailbox. Also, not a good idea. Certainly, don't keep holding on to it after you lit it. What are you saying? Those weren't built to handle that. Well, this flesh wasn't built to handle the Holy Ghost. It takes preparation. It takes spiritual growth. You need to worry about why you can't be filled with more of God. It's the will of God that you be filled. But Lord, how come I can't have more? Because you're not prepared. I preached one time on the lesson that no man takes new wine and puts it into old bottles. Why? Because the acid in the new wine will chew away at the old bottle that was made of leather. And it will cause it to burst. That's a waste. It was supposed to contain, to hold, to preserve. But it did the exact opposite. It spoiled. You're the same as a Christian. You've got to reinforce before God can put more of himself into you. You've got to let that spiritual man build up and grow enough strength so that when God pours in more power, it doesn't just cause you to come unglued. If we could contain all of it when we got saved, God would have given it all to us when we got saved. But the entire New Testament of your Bible is about growth. Tomorrow, being able to contain more than what you did today. You know how to get there? You've got to be concerned about now. You can't look at what you will be, because then all you're going to see is something that you're impressed with. Man, look at what God's going to do. Yeah, but you're not there yet. You still got work to do. You've got to be focused with now. You've got to be focused on power. Lord, what am I missing so that when we get to where we're headed to next, I can be as influential for you as possible? I don't know what people think is enough nowadays. But it's been a long time, Brother Adrian, since I've heard accounts of 
people praying for revival and revival breaking out before the preacher got there and there were people pouring into the altar days before the revival even happened and when the preacher showed up they just had a jubilee essentially right because people what they think is enough now is not enough I've read accounts where men of God would walk through plants or walk through certain sections of town and people would come running out of bars or running out of hollers and dark alleys begging him either to leave or to show him how to get saved. I don't know about you, but that means they had some power of God on them. But why didn't that happen nowadays? Because people aren't ready for that power. It'd break them. It'd destroy them. Try putting a V6 engine in a ghost cart. See what happens. You hit the gas pedal and the thing just rattle apart. People say, I want the power of God in my life, but they're not focused on what's keeping them from receiving it. We need to be focused on power, not on time, not on seasons. Lord, I desire to be used more greatly of you, so that I know that means I need more of you in me. Because it's not about having more of me, it's about having more of him. Well, he desires for you to be filled with more of him. The only thing that keeps it from happening is us. Lord, mold me and make me. I'm not satisfied with where I am now. Show me what's next. Show me where to reinforce. Show us where we've got to redesign. How do we add more of you to me? When you're worried about that, then you can have the power of God in your life. But he says, and also, you shall receive power for a purpose. He said, I'm not giving you power so that you can go out and have firework shows every night in your life. Show off for people. No. He says, I'm giving you power so that you can be witnesses of me. You know what the difference between a successful and unsuccessful business pitch? The ones that are powerful get past people's judgment. Not saying it fools them. I'm just saying it causes them to take a second look and instead of judging, they become interested. The people that fail, they never get past the fact that oh, that'll never work. Got to have some oomph in your presentations. When, when you're witnesses, you're going to try and impress them with you? That's no different than what they are. Flesh. When it comes to the problems in your life, how are you going to solve them? Same way they do? That doesn't work. We know that. What are you going to do? Let God solve the problem in your life and then just not tell anybody how it got solved? That's selfish. In fact, I dare say that's sinful because he commanded us to be witnesses. Well, to not tell about what God did for you when he's commanded us to do it sounds like sin. We're to be witnesses that have power. If we didn't need power, he would have just said, no, don't worry about the kingdom, don't worry about times and seasons, go be witnesses. He said, nope, I'm going to send you the comforter first. I'm going to send you a guide, the one that leads and guides you into all truth. Part of that power is a little bit of understanding, a little bit of wisdom, knowledge, preparation, so that when you get there, you know what God wants you to say, you know how God wants you to say it, and you say it in the right spirit. You know what that allows? That gets you out of the way so that the power of God can be manifest in your life. Amen. It's not just about having power. It's about, forgive the word, the performance. How you perform your duties. Either you do it the way God wants or you don't. Right, all these guys have got the old vintage cars or the, the muscle cars, got the big old engines in it. That don't do you any good if you don't touch the gas pedal. Otherwise, you're going to be idling at about two miles an hour, just put, putting along. It's not about the power that you have. It's about how you allow the Lord to use it in your life. He said, you're to be a witness. You're not, the, you're not supposed to be the main act, the second course, right, dessert. You're none of that. You're just the one that's telling about everything that you've seen and heard and what God's done for you. But there's a way to do that with power. 
with unction, with anointing from the Holy Ghost. Those are the people that go out and make a difference. But there's a lot of people that are being obedient to go, but there's very few that are prepared with the power that it's going to take to be effective once they get there. Stop worrying about tomorrow. Worry about what's keeping you from being what you're supposed to be today. And when tomorrow comes, you'll have the power to deal with it the way that God intended you to. Otherwise, you're going to be underpowered or even if you have the power that you need, you're going to underperform because you're focused on everything else except right now. Be attentive. Don't worry about time, seasons. God's got all that sorted out already. It'll work out in His time. Instead, worry about His power in your life. Then worry about how you're supposed to use that power to make a difference for Him. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.